Oh, it's lovely. So, so many people have joined. This is lovely. So I think that um, it's probably about time to start chatting um, to you all. Um, and those who join can hopefully uh, won't be too long. So um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining um, today. Um, we are actually um, going to record today. So if you don't want to be um, part of any of the recording, then um, just turn your cameras off if that's OK. Um, and it's great that everyone's on mute, so it's nice and nice and easy for us to talk. So yeah, thank you everyone for, for coming. My name is Ellie and I'm the Hedgerow Project Officer for CPRE Hampshire as part of our Hampshire Hedge project. Um, CPRE Hampshire have been running projects uh, focused around hedgerows for the last two years and it's our third year running. Um, and it's been amazing to be working across Hampshire and getting people out planting hedgerows and raising awareness of hedgerows and um, training lots of people in hedge laying. Um, but so our, our new project, the Hampshire Hedge, is um, bigger and more ambitious. And we are going to be connecting up the South Downs and the New Forest National Parks, which we're very lucky to have both of in Hampshire, um, with a series of interconnected hedgerows, um, connecting up existing hedgerows and um, so planting new, but also rejuvenating existing hedgerows um, and connecting up um, natural spaces in between um, and raising awareness and creating excitement around hedgerows um, in the communities that we're working in. Um, so it's lovely to have you all here today um, as our first talk of our um, uh, three winter online hedge centric talks that we're going to be doing this winter. Um, but talks are not the only way you connect with our project. We've also um, going to be doing lots of planting so if you're interested in getting out into the countryside and doing hedge planting then um, I'll put some links in the chat so you can get involved in other ways but we're also doing um, hedge laying training um, so if you're interested in that just let me know and um, we, we also do other elements for example if you, you you want to do hedge planting in your your own areas of Hampshire we have funding that we can give for hedge planting and hedge laying um, that's our community hedge fund um, <laughs> And we also going into schools and engaging with young people um, and uh, we'll be running events. So there's loads of different ways you can get um, connected with the project. So but this is our our talk series. So um, tonight um, we've got Megan Gimber from the People's Trust for Endangered Species, which is fantastic. Megan knows so much about hedgerows. Um, I'm in awe. <laughs> so it's going to be lovely. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming. And is there anything I need to say? So yeah, we're gonna. So we've got a chat. So if you want, if you've got questions, um, you're welcome to put them in the chat as we go along. We're not going to answer any questions until the end. Um, and at that point, you'll have the opportunity if you'd like to just turn your mute off and and, and ask a question. That's also fine. But if you want to put them in the chat, that's great. Um, yeah, and we'll go through them at the end. Um, but yeah, lovely. I'll put some links in, in the chat as well if you want to sign up to our newsletter, um, if you want to send me an email um, or if you want to sign up as a volunteer and help us plant some hedges. Um, but um, without further ado, I'll hand this over to Megan. All right. Thank you very much. Um, bear with me for a second whilst I remember how to share my screen. Um, let me just go through the process. Hopefully, hopefully you can just see um, a picture of me in a recently you can see. Perfect. OK, brilliant. Right. So, hi, um, I am Megan Gimber. I work for People's Trust for Endangered Species um, and technically I'm the key habitats officer. Um, but generally, I just introduce myself as the hedgerow geek because that's that's sort of what I'm, <laughs> what I'm known as and describes what I do quite well. So today I'm going to do a, a, a run through of everything that you ever wanted to know about hedges. Um, we're going to talk about why hedges are so good for wildlife, um, the structure of a good hedge, what makes a good hedge. We're going to look at how hedgerow management will benefit the hedge health and what can we do to manage our hedges better. Um, and also look at what we already know, how healthy are the hedges in this country. Um, and then I'll touch on a tiny bit about surveying hedges um, and what else we can be doing to make sure this habitat thrives. Um, at the end, as Ellie said, um, uh, I'll answer some questions. So either put them in the chat box or you can ask me live at the, at the end of it and we can have a nice good hedge chat. So some, um, some context. Um, we're obviously facing a biodiversity crisis and an environmental crisis. Um, and 
this is the most up-to-date version of the State of Nature report that came out last month, um, and it really didn't make for pleasant reading. Um, still, all the graphs that I care about are going in the wrong direction, um, uh, and we are still seeing some really sad declines of our wildlife. Um, hedges are a really good place to start to try and turn around some of these uh, some of these declining uh, graphs um, they are not going to fix everything i can't sit here and pretend hedges are going to single-handedly save us from all of these problems but they are a really good place to start um, i hope i can convince you that, they, that they're such good low-hanging fruit that the way we manage hedges can have a really instant and very big impact um not only on on the environment but but our biodiversity as well um 70 percent of the uk is agricultural land a further 12 percent is urban and obviously we have urban hedges as well so actually what we do within that is hugely important to our native wildlife this is the most recent figure. Um, I should say, I've, I've got about four depressing slides. So we're halfway through the depressing slides already. Um, this is the new figure showing the downhill trend for the farmland bird indicator species. So this is um, the, the birds that like to live in farmland between 1970 and 2021. So we've seen a huge decline, um, over 50%. Over um, most of this obviously happened in that, in that period and um, the sort of 70s, 80s, um, but we're still seeing those declines now, despite our best efforts, despite all the agri-environment schemes that we've been doing, despite our best efforts, we, we are still seeing a gradual loss. Um, and for context, the bird species that this graph represents, um, 84% of these birds use hedgerows. So hedgerows are really a very important habitat to these birds at a time of need. Uh, but similarly, we've lost up to 70% of our dormouse population since the year 2000, um, and about 50% of our hedgehog population since the since year 2000 as well. Um, and again, there are loads of factors that are contributing to these declines. It's not just the way we've been managing hedges, but given that so many of these species do rely on good, healthy, well-managed hedgerows, actually making sure we can provide those can be a vital lifeline for these species in their time of need. Um, and what's more, we can do an awful lot just by tweaking the way we manage our existing hedgerow network we have the potential to see some really rapid change with little to no encroachment on the land that feeds us um, because the infrastructure is mostly already there. We'll touch on that uh, in a bit. So in conservation, we've got um, two very different strategies for protecting wildlife. There's land sparing um, and land sharing. So land sparing is the idea that we set aside land, um, it gets on with its thing, and it's separated from the actions of us. Um, land sharing, on the other hand, is the idea that we manage land in a way that benefits us, generally producing food, um, but also supporting wildlife at the same time. So this is, I think, really interesting at the moment because there's some fierce debate between those that favour rewilding and those that favour regenerative agriculture. Um, so the idea is, do we go for land separation? Do we go for integration? It's a massive debate. Um, Personally, I believe there's there's space for for both, and we can we can learn, and they can share, and they can they can actually work quite harmoniously together. Um, but when it comes to land sharing, hedgerows have the potential to help, and they have some really easy wins. So, hedges are incredible for wildlife. That's why I'm sat here. Um, George Eustace recently described them as the single most important ecological building block left in this country, um, to which I would not disagree. I think that's a great way of describing them. Um, and when you look at how good they are for wildlife, it's just mind blowing. There was one study done by one of my absolute hedgerow heroes, Robert Walton, um, down in Devon. So he looked at one hedgerow on his farm. It was a sort of 85, 90 metre hedgerow. Um, and he found 2,070 different species living on that one hedgerow, which is just to me absolutely mind blowing. 2,070 species in one hedge in Devon. So imagine what they have the capacity to, to, to harbour nationwide. So how do they do it? Um, so for wildlife, they've got three main roles. First is a physical home 
So many species um, use hedges as nesting or as overwintering sites, and they're basically living in the hedge. So this might be nesting birds, hibernating hedgehogs, dormice, other small mammals, bumblebees, um, all sorts of insects actually physically living in the structure of the hedge itself. Secondly, they're an excellent complementary habitat. So some things don't necessarily live in a hedge, but they use it either to hunt um, or to gather fruits or, or to um, shelter from the elements or to shelter from predators. Um, birds, for example, might use hedgerow trees as song posts, as territory markers. This photo is a photo of a barn owl in my orchard, and he regularly hunts alongside the hedge um, for any voles and moles he can find there. And then we think have things like field fares and red wings. Um, those are, are wonderful bird species that have, that have come over at this, for this time of year to enjoy the hedgerow fruits during the winter months. And lastly, for the ecological roles, um, this is what a lot of people know hedges as, they're wildlife corridors. So they connect up populations um, that would otherwise be isolated and vulnerable. And they help our, our wildlife navigate the countryside. So these corridors allow things like bats, butterflies, moths, dormice, hedgehogs, all sorts of things to actually move around the countryside um, between remnant patches of other habitats um, and maybe connecting up remnant populations. So some species might use a hedge for just one of these three, three roles, um, but there's loads of species that will actually need it for all three. Bats are a really good example of this. Um, they need three things to thrive in habitat. They need somewhere to roost, they need a safe commute and they need insects to feed on. And hedges and hedgerow trees can provide all three of those. So again, reflecting their use as a home, a food source and connectivity. So 75% of our bat species will roost in trees. So hedgerow trees are particularly important. Then we know they echolocate and commute along the hedge lines. That's how they navigate the countryside. Um, and of course, they will also be feeding on the sort of the insect biomass that a hedge can generate as well. Um, and it's not just um, providing the, the biomass for those in the, the biomass of insects for, for the um, bats to feed on, but actually the shelter for those insects to be out and flying. So it might be that you've got some cold or rainy or stormy night um, and it's only in the shelter of hedges that those insects will be up and about. So, again, providing the shelter to provide the food to make sure bats can go out and feed. Next up, we've got hedgehogs. So again, they use it for all three. They will hibernate at the bottom of a hedge. They will feed on invertebrates in the hedgerow margins. Um, and they like to bimble across sort of linear features. So they actually use them to, to navigate the landscape um, where they can seek shelter as and, as and when they need to. Um, and dormice, this is my favourite, I think, example of a hedge using all three elements, uh, sorry, a, a, an animal using all three elements. So you, we might normally think of them as a coppice woodland species, um, but actually they, they are, they do also live in, in, in hedgerows and hedges can, can support sustaining breeding populations of dormice, which is very, very important. But to do this, the hedges need to be good hedges. So they need to be managed well, but they also really need to be species rich. So dormice are really interesting. We call them succession feeders. They might start off, um, they wake up from a hibernation in spring and they'll start off eating the blossom from blackthorn flowers, which is ever so cute. Then they'll move on to things like um, aphids and ash keys. They'll move on to blackberries. They'll move on to, to um, uh, hazelnuts later in the season. So really actually to sustain a dormouse, you need lots of different species in your hedge um, to actually fully support them throughout the year. And of course, um, dormice are what we call arboreal creatures. So they don't actually like traveling across the ground. They much prefer traveling around the countryside from branch to branch. So it's hedges that provide the safest way for dormice to cross our countryside. And of course, for things like this, it's really important that populations are connected. It helps, it makes sure that there's gene flow between the dormice in different woodland populations. It allows movement so that we can recover declining populations. Um, and it can allow dormice to migrate to suitable new habitats as and when it becomes available. Um, sadly, the effect of climate change is, is likely going to make this ability to relocate and to migrate um, increasingly important for things like our dormice. So how, how does a, 
how does a man-made habitat, and at the end of the day, a hedge is a man-made habitat, why is it so good for wildlife? Um, I, I think this is complicated, but fascinating. So I'll give you the short version. Um, the short version is that hedgerows mimic the habitat that you'd find at a woodland edge. It's, we call them a woodland edge um, ecotone. And for this, hedges have like overlapping elements of woodland, flowering scrub and grassland. So a hedge won't replicate any of those habitats fully, um, but what it does mean is it's capable of supporting many of the species from each of them. Like 80% of what we would normally call woodland bird species will also live in hedges. For some species, it's actually greater than the sum of its parts because there's some species that don't just like the woodland elements, they like the pasture, the flowering scrub and the woodland elements together and actually it's this combination of features that allow them to, to, to really thrive. And the reason that we've got so many species that seem to just adore this combination of features is that actually it quite nicely replicates what we think the pre-agricultural wildwood might have looked like. So it's unlikely that it would have been wall-to-wall -wall closed canopy wood which is what I was taught when I was a kid. Um, there, would, there would never be a, a, a squirrel that could hop from John O'Groats to Land's End without touching the ground. But actually, we had large herbivores that would move around, around the countryside. They would crash, they would crunch, they'd knock things over, they'd browse things. There would be um, a dynamic habitat as a result of that. So we would have woodland, of course, we had, would have had plenty of woodland, but we would have also had glades, areas of scrub, areas of pasture with scattered trees. There would have been a whole load of this flowering scrub. Um, and there wouldn't have been any harsh dividing lines between woodland and pasture. It would have been much more of a mix, much more of this woodland edge ecotone. So this would be what we call a mosaic of habitats. And it would be constantly shifting over time as herbivores moved between the different areas. So this dynamic edge habitat this is what most of our wildlife will have adapted to. And perhaps that explains why any cultural woodland edge habitat, things like a hedge, a traditional orchard and wood pasture are so rich in wildlife. So for hedges, we've just squeezed this amazing habitat into narrow corridors. So we've lost some of that spatial dynamism. We don't allow our hedges to sort of encroach into our fields. At the end of the day, a girl's got to eat. We've got to farm the land in between. Um, but what we can do is make sure this habitat keeps that wonderful dynamism by making sure we manage it through a life cycle approach. And only managing them on a life cycle will they keep those wonderful, valuable stages of, of habitat succession that makes them so very valuable for wildlife. And conveniently, this, is, this isn't any new way of doing it. But actually, this is just what we've been doing for centuries. We've been managing our hedgerows according to their life cycle. We keep the dynamism. We reset hedge succession when they mature out of the Goldilocks stage of, of growth. Um, and we end up creating this habitat, which is really useful for us as, as land barriers. But it's also ecological dynamite for wildlife. So in this way, our network of hedges crisscross all over the countryside, provide three main roles for wildlife, home, food and shelter and connectivity. Um, and they do this through showing the woodland edge, the flowering scrub and the, the, the grazed pasture. And I think these two ideas can really help guide our management. All of our management decisions can be improved at a landscape level by considering how they're going to affect not just the structure of our hedges, but also how our hedges function for wildlife. So I'm going to run through what we think makes a good hedge. What, what's the structure of a good hedge? So first of all is a mix of plant species. The more the better from my point of view. So hedges with more plant species have a higher diversity of invertebrates and birds. Partly that's because each species will have a, a set of invertebrates that specialise on feeding on it. Um, but it also tends to mean you get a better year round availability of food sources because all of these different species will flower and fruit at slightly different times of the year. So this is a visualized, visual representation showing the blossom sequence. 
it shows you that the more species you've got in your hedge, the longer it will blossom for. And then the longer it will, which is a succession feeder, um, it's fed for a larger proportion of the year. Next up, the hedge's height and width. So generally making a hedge bigger tends to make it better. It tends to increase the diversity and the abundance of wildlife within it. Um, because not only are they bigger, they've got more hedge habitat volume, but actually they're, they have a more complex habitat. So the larger and more complex hedges provide better shelter for foraging birds and they reduce predation for nesting birds as well. Unfortunately, there is no one hedge size that we should all be aiming for. Um, and this harks back to the idea that hedges need to be dynamic. They need to be constantly going through the process of succession and cycling through. So if anybody asks me, um, what is the perfect size for this hedge? It's just a bit bigger than it was last year or, or bigger on average within its, within its life cycle. Next up, we want structural complexity. So some species need several hedge features throughout their life cycle. Um, but actually, some species have slightly different needs from a hedge than others. Things like a yellow hammer might prefer a, a tight, close trimmed hedge and the density that that provides. But others like the big, woolly, wild outgrown hedges that are more akin to sort of a woodland or a woodland edge um, elements. And actually, what we'd love to see is a mix of different hedge structures, different shapes, it's different sizes across a landscape at any one time. Um, and luckily, this is one of the natural side effects of managing a hedge on its life cycle rotation. You will always get ones that have just been laid, ones that are, are nice and trimmed, some that have been grown out for a couple of years, and some that have been put into a period of intervention and have got a bit big. So as soon as we move back into the idea of managing them on a life cycle, we naturally get this wonderful difference in structure across the landscape. Next up, we want to see good connectivity with our hedges. So not only do we is it important that they um, connect up patches of woodland, rivers, ponds and other habitats, um, but actually it's really important that they, that they are intact and they don't have too many gaps within the hedge itself. We also want to see a good margin. So a margin is really important. Not only do 40% of the priority species that depend on hedgerows use the margins. Um, they're really important um, nesting sites, overwintering sites, fantastic for wildlife. Um, but actually it also protects the hedge itself. If we cropped right up to the bo bottom of a hedge, we would be churning over that soil, we would be disturbing the roots of the hedge. Now, it might not kill it outright, but maybe the next drought that comes along will kill those hedge plants if, if we've, we've churned up too many of the roots, similarly with those hedgerow trees. So actually having a margin there, a decent margin, not only fantastic for wildlife, but actually a really good protection for the hedge itself. Likewise, we want to see this hedge dense all the way to the ground. Now this is crucially important for the shelter that it provides. Things like nesting birds. There are lots of bird species that for some weird reason like to nest at knee height. Um, so if your hedge doesn't have a knee height, then where do they go? Um, but it's also really important for insects and reptiles and small mammals like hedgehogs that need a good thick base of a hedge um, for shelter and to hibernate in. Unfortunately, the base of a hedge can grow thin, um, sometimes through grazing damage, if, you've, if your sheep have got in and undergrazed them. Sometimes deer will do that as well. Um, the top left example in this slide shows a hedge that has been over trimmed and, and has lost its base. Um, but you, big, tall hedges will sometimes shade out that base as well. Um, so this is what we call the base canopy is, is when that when the hedge gets a bit too leggy. And lastly, when we're looking at hedgerow structures, we want to look at hedgerow trees as well. So hedge trees are really very important for the hedgerow habitat. So over half of the priority species associated with hedges need hedgerow trees to be there. They fulfill that woodland element of that, of that habitat wheel. So they provide song posts, territory markers for important bird behaviors. They provide nesting opportunities for birds, bats, and more. But also in a year where a hedge has been cut, the hedge below won't be able to flower and fruit, but the hedge trees up above will. So it provides another buffer 
for species to actually um, have some food. It's a, a food buffer, as it were. Um, you also get wonderful old hedge trees, um, especially if you if you are looking at boundary hedges or ancient hedgerows. So these are all old pollard trees, and these are all within walking distance of my house. Um, fantastic, beautiful old pollard trees. Um, really, really valuable dead wood habitat for some very rare deadwood dependent species. Now, they're not particularly glamorous area of research, so we don't know that, mu that much about them. But what we do know is we've got over 2000 species of deadwood dependent insects in this country. Um, so a huge number of, of species that we don't know that much about. Um, but what we do know is that at least 320 of those are known pollinators. We know this is a very important group. Um, but when it comes to hedgerow trees, sadly, we have lost a large number. So um, these two um, pictures are of the same area of land. One is an ordnance survey map from the 1880s, um, and the other is what that land looks like today. Um, on the left hand side, all of those little dots that you can see, those are individual mature hedgerow trees. Um, and on the right hand side, I think we've got five left. So we've lost obviously a huge number to Dutch elm disease, about 20 million. Um, we're about to lose loads to ash dieback. Um, and unfortunately ash is our most popular hedgerow tree in the country. Um, and we've not been establishing enough new trees in our hedges to accommodate that. Um, but to me, I would say, you know, tree planting is all the rage. Establishing hedgerow trees seems to be a no brainer to me. Um, it's not like we're taking land out of agricultural production. We can still we can still farm the fields in between. Um, they form open grown trees, which have fantastic benefits to them. They're really flexible. So when you can coppice them, you can pollard them, you can leave them as standards. You can choose small species in your east to west hedges where it doesn't do too much shading into the field and put your whopping great ones, your beeches and your, your oaks in your north to south hedges um, where they're really good wind protection as well. And actually you can establish them for free. This is one of my favorite photos. Um, it's uh, a photo from some called Gail who um, was photographing a farmer doing some hedge laying. Now hedge laying is a fantastic opportunity to establish new hedge trees because all you need to do is find a stem that looks particularly nice and just don't don't lay it, <laughs> leave it there and automatically you've got a hedgerow tree. Um, and this has loads and loads of benefits but one of the benefits of establishing trees in this way uh, is actually you're preserving the sort of inherent um, local genetic diversity of the trees of your local tree populations which is very, very important, increasingly important with climate change. But of course, you can also plant hedge trees um, and call me an optimist. But whenever I see a gap in a hedge, I just think it's a great place to stick a tree. Um, but the, the, the origin story of a hedge has a big impact on all of these elements of the structure, um, not just how it looks, but what's in it. Um, uh, and you know, how, how it functions for wildlife. Uh, not all hedgerows were born equal. So top left, you've got some sort of stone hedges up there. Those are some, some hedges in Cornwall. So there were some estimates of Cornish hedges that are up to about 5,000 years old. Dartmoor still has Bronze Age hedgerows. We've got maps that show individual named hedges in the same place for about a thousand years. There's, um. It, down in Devon, where, where I'm from, about two thirds of our hedges, which are on banks, are medieval or older. Um, and of course, we had the enclosure hedges. So there was a period of time called the enclosures, um, where where land was taken from the from the common lands um, and he hedged basically. Um, and we we gained about two hundred thousand miles of hedging this way. But that's only about half of our hedges. The other half are, are, are much much older. Um, we've even got some hedge, which this still is still just amazes me. They're what we call assart hedges, um, and they're actually strips of wildwood that we left when we cleared fields. So we cut down fields out of our wildwood, and we left strips and turned those into hedges. So to me, it's absolutely no surprise that hedges such as this 
are chock full of ancient woodland indicator species, full of plants, full of fungi, home to a huge proportion of the genetic diversity of our tree and shrub populations, because they represent the last frontiers of our, our ancient wildwood. And just to think that the, the soils below hedges are as old as the hedges being stood there. So that's the soil structures, the fungi um, compositions. It's all very, very, very um, old and exciting. So of course, I'm, I'm gonna go through a few of the benefits of hedges. Um, it's not just wildlife that benefit from hedgerows, um, but actually, you know, we're, I think we're becoming increasingly aware how very, very valuable they are for our farming as well, as well as our battle against the climate change. So this is a poster that I made um, over lockdown. Um, it's called The Benefits of Healthy Hedgerows. Um, I was going to call it What Have Hedgerows Ever Done For Us? Um, but apparently not everyone would have got the joke, so I had to give it a, a bit more of a boring name instead. Um, so I'm going to run through this quite quickly. Um, I I could do a whole talk on this, but there's just too much too much to say. Um, if you want more detail, head to the website, head to our website on the PTS Hedgerows page, um, and it's got a lot more detail on this. But I'll I'll run through a, a few of them. So first of all, hedges provide valuable shelter for livestock. So livestock without shelter have a higher mortality rate and require more food. Um, shelter increases lamb survival rates in spring because it reduces the effects of wind chill and of hypothermia. So really very important to our livestock farming. Similarly, in the summer, they provide shade. Now, we all know on a hot summer's day, um, every time you, you go around the countryside, you know where the livestock's going to be. It's going to be in whatever shade it can find. Um, and being in this shade helps to reduce heat stress. Heat stress is really, really important. Um, it can reduce milk yield in dairy herds. It affects fertility, growth rates, immune function, all sorts. Um, also, it's uh, hedges are really good uh, form of diverse browse. Cow cows aren't grass eating animals. Cows, cows, it will go out and eat whatever plants they can find. They'll they'll browse on trees. They'll browse on hedges. And actually, that diversity of food is really very good for them. If you're not interested in livestock, hedges do also benefit crops. Um, first of all, they provide a windbreak. So they're semi-permeable, which means they can take the strength out of the wind without actually complete solid wall um, would create turbulence on the leeward side um, whereas because a hedge is semi-permeable it just takes the strength out um, and actually the shelter that it provides is up to 12 times the height of the hedge into the field so if your hedge is two meters tall that can provide 24 meters of shelter into your into your fields so hedges might also help us reduce pesticide use so they do this by increasing the populations of what we call beneficial insects um, and these are what they're, they're predatory things so predatory spiders ground beetles parasitic wasps hoverflies lace wings um, all these things that will live in the hedge and then commute out into the field to gobble up things like aphids which pest our, our, our crops um, similarly they're home to a diverse population of pollinators so they do this in two ways first of all obviously a hedge will be in flower right from the right from blackthorn um, all the way through to ivy later on in the season. Um, so they provide food for pollinators pretty much the whole season, whereas our crops obviously might be two weeks of pollination food, and that's about it. So they sustain our pollinators for a large, the large portion of the year, but also they give them a place to live. I mean, most of our pollinators won't make a nest in cropped land. They need uncropped lands. They need a diverse group of habitats that a hedge will provide for their overwintering sites and also for their summer breeding nests. Um, sadly, on that note, the recent State of Nature report revealed that we had strong declines in insect groups that provide some of these ecosystem functions. So a 34% decline in the insects associated with pest control and an 18% decline um, in pollinator species. Um, but it did also say that nature friendly farming, which includes hedgerows, can be a good a way to address some of these losses. Next up for hedge benefits, hedges can help reduce soil erosion, which is really very important. 
they can um they can also play an important role in times of flood so plant root, roots um they actually help speed up the rate in which water gets soaked into the soil it's not the roots taking the water up themselves although they do do that as well but it's it's um it's just the mechanical way that they increase the infiltration into the soil and this means they help the soil become basically a sponge to soak up flood water rather than allowing it to run off the surface and this does two things. First of all, it helps protect our soil, but it also um, protects our rivers and our streams from silting up and it protects our rivers and our streams from getting all sorts of the, the sort of herbicides, pesticides and, and, and all the things that we put in our on our farmland. Um, Water is not the only thing they soak up. Hedges soak up pollution, they soak up air pollution, noise pollution, sediment pollution, um, stopping lots of that reaching our rivers. And of course, they also soak up carbon. Um, carbon is very topical at the moment. Um, and lots of people are looking to hedges um, in our fight against climate change. The Interparliamentary Panel for Climate Change um, recommended we extend our hedges by 40%. CPRE also championed that 40% call for an increase in hedge extent. Um, and the NFU have also highlighted how valuable hedges are going to be by, uh, for hitting their target of, of net zero by 2040. Um, and hedges actually store carbon in many different ways. So they store it in their structure, that sort of tangly, um, sort of scrubby growth. They store it in the trees above them. They store it in the roots below ground. And they also store it in what we call accumulated soil carbon in the soil around the roots of the hedgerow plants. And things like that accumulated soil carbon, that will be accumulating for up to about 50 years. So if we lost a hedge, we would then lose 50 years worth of accumulated carbon in the soil as well. And I think that's often not accounted for. Um, and because we know hedges store carbon in many different ways, this gives us many different options for increasing their carbon storage. So I would say making sure we gap them up so that they're, they're all in a, a nice, you know, uniform and, and they're all connected making sure their structure is bigger on average within their life cycle more hedgerow trees and then we can be planting more hedgerows as well so lots of ways we can actually be increasing the amount of carbon that our hedges are, are storing and then there's loads of there's loads of other benefits that hedgerows have you know they they improve our privacy they they'll screen farm assets which can reduce um, opportunistic rural crime um, but also I, I think they add to the sense of place and I, and I would say our general well-being certainly my general well-being um, they're a defining feature of our countryside the next time you go up a big hill I challenge you to look about at the countryside around you and just try to picture what it would look like if we did lose all of our hedging so how do we keep them in good health Obviously, the way we manage our hedges has a huge impact um, on how good they are for wildlife. Um, also, how good they are, you know, for, for all of those other benefits that I've just described. Um, and really, how we manage them even affects their capacity to act as wildlife corridors. Um, the level of fragmentation in this hedge shown here makes these ones nearly impossible um, for animals such as dormice to use these hedges for any of the three main uses. This hedge isn't providing habitat, it's not providing shelter, food or connectivity. And I'll argue that it's not providing any of the things that of those benefits on farm that I've just reeled off either. So there's a huge opportunity, I would say, to, when we look at things like this, but there's a huge opportunity for improvement. So um, we did go through some dark decades. Um, we had some government incentivized hedgerow removal after the war. We lost up to about 50% um, of the hedging in this country. Um, at the time, we thought this was in the nation's best interest. Um, I think we know better now, but we have that legacy of that of that loss. Um, and I think we do need to, to, to see the, what we're doing in, in, that, in that context. Um, luckily, I'm glad to say this outright removal is largely behind us, especially in the agricultural sector. Um, in the agricultural sector, I see more new hedging being planted than ever, which is fantastic. Um, this graph, I think, is uh, one of pure hope and optimism. It shows a massive uptick in planting and gapping up 
of hedges in the last couple of years. So those last two columns, those really tall ones that tower above all of the others, that was 2020 and 2021. Um, so really that, that uptick in planting is, is very, very encouraging. But I think what I would say, it's, it's worth remembering that what we have now shouldn't be considered, don't adequately replace the value of the old ones. Um, and that given the historic loss, I would say it's more important than ever that our remaining hedges are kept healthy. We've got to put the emphasis on managing our existing hedgerows um, to make sure that they, they, they remain healthy. But we do still risk losing many of them. And largely that's because of the way they're being managed. Um, the last countryside survey showed that only 31% of our hedges were in good condition with appropriately managed margins nationally. Um, and in some areas, this dropped to just 10%. Um, and in most cases, this is just because hedges are no longer being managed in their life cycle. We've dropped out of this life cycle approach to management and they're being managed on a much more sort of inflexible, static way. So I think now is probably a good time for me to just go quickly through what we think good management looks like. Um, and I think I'll start at the beginning with a young, lovely young hedge. So how do we establish a good hedge? So it's more than just putting some whips in the ground, that's planting a good hedge. But from there, we need to go through the establishment as well. So from my point of view, there are three good ways to establish a good hedge and one terrible way. So the first good way of making a good hedge, this is my favorite option, hands down, is to plant them. So you generally plant them at five or six whips per meter in a double staggered row, that's quite standard. Next would be to leave it to grow, just to do its thing. Grow completely untrimmed for 10, 15 years and then lay it. And after you lay it, you trim it incrementally bigger and bigger and bigger. Now what this does, that the laying that takes your five or six whips per meter and it multiplies that stem density. So it turns it into a much thicker, denser hedge right from the bottom up. What it also does is it gives you a really good opportunity to take off those plastic spiral guards. Um, and I speak from experience when I say there's no good time to take off, <laughs> to rummage around at the base of a hedge, taking them off if there's not a good reason like laying. Um, but what it also does is it takes away that, I call it a spiral tube shadow, which is about 70 centimetres um, of bare unbranching growth at the bottom of a young hedge where the spiral guard was. So that again, it creates that thickness right the way to the ground. This is absolute gold, gold star, A++. This is the best way of establishing a hedge. Option two is basically exactly the same, except you coppice it instead of lay it. And the third option is when you do the incremental trimming, which is trimming higher and wider, um, right from the start. So right from year one, you just trim higher and wider, higher and wider, higher and wider, higher and wider. And you end up with a really decent, well branching, um, dense hedgerow. Um, this is a good way of doing hedges. It's not my favorite because you're still five or six um, whips per meter. Um, you haven't given it that opportunity to multiply each one of those stems at the base, which is what coppicing and laying will do. Um, and you've probably, let's be honest, still got the spiral guards on because, again, there's never a good time to, to take them off. Um, this is a, an image of a hedge that was done by that first method. So planted the five or six whips a meter. It was left to just grow. It was laid and now it's being trimmed. So this is a very young hedge and you would not know it. It's absolutely glorious. Um, it's a really good opportunity to establish new hedgerow trees this way as well. That hedgerow tree was established as part of that method. So the, the way of establishing hedges that we absolutely would uh, recommend avoiding is letting your hedge grow to the height that you want it and then just repeatedly trimming it there. Um, the reason for this is that uh, the way trimming works is that you get the growth from just below where you trimmed it. So if you trim it to the same point over and over again, that's where all your growth is going to come from. So it's um, you don't end up having a thick, dense hedge from the base up. You've just got this sort of 
top heavy um, elements of growth at the top and a fairly feeble hedge for it. Um, and actually, I've seen hedges that are 20 years old that are starting to, to crumble and look really, really feeble. They'll get stressed out. They'll lose stems. Um, basically, this is uh, not a very good way to, um, to, to establish a hedge. Uh, this is, in fact, this hedge is only about ooh, five years old. Um, and it's already showing that it's very, very thin in the bottom. Um, and all the growth, all the growth density is just coming from that one trim line at the top. Um, so it's it's not not the best way of doing it. So how do we establish a hedge once it's once we how do we manage it once it's established? So firstly, I would say they do require management. Um, we can't just leave them to do their own thing or they turn into a line of trees without trimming. The species in our hedges have this natural tendency to grow upwards, um, eventually becoming tree lines. And this is actually sped up because they're planted so close together that they compete with each other for light. So they're desperately trying to compete and go upwards. Now, of course, a line of trees doesn't sound like a bad thing. I love trees as much as the next person does, probably more than. Um, but actually what you end up doing is you end up losing that um, flowering scrub element because that gets out competed. Um, so you've already lost one of your wheels of, of the hedge ecotone um, and they turn into lines of trees that you can't sustain lines of trees at that density. So they end up getting tall um, and some will topple. They eventually get gappy. Um, so you lose that connectivity um, and you, they end up turning into sort of gappy lines of occasional trees that basically they're not permanent features in our countryside not like a hedge can be so we know we need to trim them at some point um, or do some form of hedge management but what does that look like how do we trim them well so I think understanding how trimming works is really important so trimming what it does taking off the um the growing tips takes out um takes out a hormone and it changes the balance of hormones in the plant and what that does is it takes out the hormone that encourages that race to the sky and it makes your plant put more effort into branching growth instead so instead of racing up they kind of poof out like a puffer fish um, so what you can do is you can utilize this natural response in our in our plant species to create a really dense hedge Again, one that's fantastic for shelter, one that's fantastic for nesting birds. And this is by lightly trimming, slightly higher and slightly wider. Really, really very good. And it's a really good way to establish that density in a, in a young hedge. Unfortunately, when hedges are trimmed to the same point and trimmed too frequently, um, it can do some real damage. Um, so cutting every year often goes hand in hand with cutting at the same height. Um, and together, this leads to what I call chronic over trimming. So it reduces the value of the hedge to wildlife, um, of course, um, but it also threatens the future of the hedge structure itself. As the hedge matures, it can't tolerate this um, repeated um, management again and again and again. So you end up losing that the structure at the base of the hedge, that wonderful density at the bottom, um, and then sometimes the plants within the hedge start struggling so much that one or two will die. Now, one or two, you won't notice. Um, the hedge just sort of stretches to, to fill it. But the more you lose, the further the remaining hedge plants have to stretch to fill those gaps. And eventually, you know, you lose another one and, and there, there it is. You've got a gappy hedge. Um, so this initial sort of lowering of the stem density is a real sign that the hedge is struggling with that management. Um, and in this way, you know, hedges are literally fading from the countryside. They're lost through this sort of static management where they're trimmed too frequently at the same height. Um, but what I'm here to say is that's completely avoidable. <laughs> we can totally avoid this with just a couple of tweaks to how we actually manage them. So if your hedge management is going to involve trimming, then knowing that most of our hedge plants blossom and fruit on second year wood and older gives us two trimming options that still allows our hedge to flower and fruit. So number one is longer trimming rotations. So trimming them maybe every three years rather than every year. I think these this set of photos um, is from Martin Lines of the Nature Friendly Farming Network. And I think it quite elegantly shows the, the difference between a one year, two year and a three year trimmed hedgerow. 
um, that that one on the right is just covered in blossom. That's that's the third year of, of a three year trimming. You can even take this up to a five year trimming cycle if you've got the right equipment. Um, but what that does is it means it's a, a, a larger cut when you actually make it. And of course, with more blossom comes more fruit. So you'll get more fruit if you do these these um, these longer trimming rotations. Um, even if you've got a hugely diverse mixed species hedge, if it's trimmed to the same points every year, you will be massively reducing how useful it is for wildlife. The second option, if you're going to be trimming, is do what we call incremental trimming. This is trimming higher and wider every time you trim. So just a bit higher, just a bit wider, just a bit higher, just a bit wider. It can just be 15 centimeters. That's all it needs to be. Um, but what this does is it means you get a border of young fruiting and flowering wood around the edge of your hedge every year. So even though you're trimming your hedge every year, you will always have young wood that will flower and fruit. Um, what it also does is it avoids um, the structural damage to the hedge itself and it ends up having a wonderful hedge. This example here, um, I would say the results speak for themselves. This is an example of a hedge that's trimmed every single year, but this is trimmed higher and wider each time. Um, and I'd say this is, I think it's quite inspiring. This is what's achievable even under what we'd call a fairly intensive annual trimming regime. Next up, I think I've covered sort of how and, and how often, um, but when, when should we be trimming our hedges? I would argue wherever possible, trim our hedges January and February. We want all of that fruit to stay on those hedges, feeding our winter visitors, feeding our mammals all through winter. Um, and then we can trim them in January, February. I know this isn't possible in all places. In some places, we've got things like clay and the, and the, the, the ground gets water soaked. Um, but where possible, trimming them later really does make a difference. And then sometimes I'd say it's best to do nothing at all for a while. Just let your hedge grow out, get big and blousy and beautiful and blossom filled. Um, but we can't leave that to do that for, for an eternity. We, we need at some point to then move it onto the next stage of its life cycle, which will always have to involve rejuvenation. So no matter how well you manage your hedge, it will at some point need rejuvenation. So rejuvenation could be hedge laying or it could be coppicing, but what it does is it resets your hedge life cycle. It thickens it back up from the base and you can start the whole process again. So this photo shows a beautifully laid hedge. Oh, I've gone too far. For those for those that are unfamiliar with the process of hedge laying, um, the idea is that you cut your hedge maybe 75 or 80% of the way through each stem. You cut it at the very, very base, and then you bend over the stems. So those stems are still attached to the roots, so they are still alive, and they form this wonderful sort of living fence, stock proof, thick dense wonderful but the magic the magic happens at that place where you where you made that cut where you made that cut at the bottom it acts like a coppice stool so from one stem you might get five you might get ten new stems coming from the very ground coming from the base of that stool so this gives your hedge a whole nother lifespan it's almost like you've got a brand new hedge it's fantastic um no hedge is, is immortal unless you lay it. So it's not cutting them down, it's helping them live forever. And I find it incredible to think that the reason we've got so many ancient hedges is thanks to an unbroken chain of care and periodic rejuvenation. So every hedge has been carefully laid from time to time through their many centuries, maybe once in a generation, a hedge needs to be laid and it gives it a whole nother life cycle. So hedges are essentially made immortal by the skills and the management passed from farmer to farmer, from hedge layer to hedge layer, from generation to generation. And I think it acts as a cautionary tale because hedges will only survive if we carry on doing this. Um, they, they will eventually mature out of it and die unless we go through this rejuvenation cycle. So if you put all that together, you get this, which is the hedgerow management cycle. Um, and it's the fav my favourite diagram of all time. Um, 
this is based on the amazing work of Nigel Adams. So Nigel Adams is my other absolute hedge hero. He um, uh, from the Natural Hed National Hedge Laying Society, he created this wonderful way of categorizing hedgerows into the, the Adams 10 point scale. So what this looks like when you piece it together is a life cycle. You know, a hedges are a living habitat. They need dynamic management based on their life cycle. So it, this all looks a little bit confusing. I'll strip it down in the center here. This is what we want to see. This is good sort of life cycle management. We lay a hedge, we let it grow up. We might trim it. We might do incremental trimming. We might do three year trimming. We might put it into a period of non-intervention for a while and then we lay it again. So that's that's what we want to see. If we let our hedges grow too, too big and too tall and we don't rejuvenate them, they do turn into lines of trees. But luckily, unless they've got properly to that line of tree stage, they can still be recovered. They can still be recovered through laying and through coppicing. And on the other side of it, the other flank is, um, this is what we see when we have over trimmed hedges. We see a uh, lot of density at the base. Um, they end up getting gappy and losing stems. But again, those, those, those purple arrows and pink boxes show that actually even these hedges, we can recover back into being dense, good, well-managed hedges through coppicing, through laying, um, and through planting up some of those gaps. So to me, I take a lot of um, a lot of hope from this image. It basically shows no matter where your hedge is, there is a way of bringing it back into being a really, really good, dense, wildlife rich hedgerow. And there are lots of clues that hedges give us if we learn to speak their language. Um, they tell us when they need a change of management. Um, this is a, just a few images. Um, uh, that I've taken from, I made a whole library on the website, uh, a library called Reading Hedges, um, just to help understand which indicators hedges give us to tell us that actually they could do with a change of management. Um, and there's a huge amount of information. We to, to help, we created two hedgerow surveys. So we've created one called the Great British Hedgerow Survey, which is geared towards wildlife groups and volunteers. Um, and one that is an app called Healthy Hedgerows, which we have made specifically for farmers. So the full hedgerow survey, the Great British Hedgerow Survey, takes about 20 minutes to do. The data is really important to us because it helps us understand the health of the hedgerows nationwide. Um, but what it also does is it's, it's quite a simple form that makes it look more complicated than it is. Um, but what it does is it gives you feedback about the structure about the connectivity and about the wildlife values of your hedge, even and gives you scores for each one of those. And it gives you a blow for blow account in every place that your hedge might have lost points and what you can do about it. So it will also give you management advice for every hedge you survey. Um, this is me doing a hedge survey on one of our um, uh, nature reserves on the Isle of Wight. It correctly identified this hedge as in desperate need of rejuvenation. So me and a team of volunteers went out and laid this hedge. Then the following, this was a season and a half of growth. Um, look how amazingly it has recovered because it was in pretty poor shape when we, when we, when we laid it. Um, we will give this hedge a cursory trim to really thicken it up and encouraging that branching regrowth. Um, what you might not be able to see, I don't know if you can see it, on the on the left hand side, there's a sort of reddish smudge. That's actually a hawthorn tree. It was part of the hedge, but we just didn't lay it. So we made a, a hedgerow tree instead. Um, and that hedgerow tree now blossoms and fruits even when that hedge below is being trimmed. Um, uh, it's, so it, it just goes to show how easy it is to establish hedgerow trees and how valuable they are because that will be providing fruit even when this hedge is just recovering from that rejuvenation. So on the website, this photo gallery is telling you what stage is what and showing you what to look out for. Um, uh, and we've also got this app, as I mentioned, this one we've designed specifically for farmers. So the Healthy Hedgerows app makes it much quicker to do your hedges. You know, it's all right doing one or two, but if you've got an entire farm to do, you need to do it efficiently. <laughs> so this is just six questions long. Um, it doesn't give such detailed feedback, but what it does do um, in six questions is assess where in the life cycle your hedge is and what management advice we can give on a hedge by hedge basis. 
then it puts it all together onto a map which helps you look on a landscape level, on a farm level, where your good hedges are and where your hedges that need attention might be. Um, and this is the idea that we can use this to create these hedge management plans at a farm scale um, and take all those landscape considerations into effect. So I, th there's an old adage that says you can't improve what you're not measuring. These surveys are designed to help improve hedges one by one by demystifying hedgerow management and offering bespoke advice about what to do on a hedge by hedge basis. They work at a local level, helping inform management decisions that can be pieced together at a farm scale. So what do I ultimately want to see? I want to see hedgerows bigger, better and more joined up. I want to see them fulfilling their potential um, economically, ecologically and environmentally. I would love to see fewer gaps, more trees, um, and more hedges managed on a life cycle that includes rejuvenation. Um, I always like to end the talk on this poster. It's one that I made through lockdown. Um, you won't be able to see the detail on the screen, but it's on the website if you want to have a look at it. It shows the long and exciting history of our hedges. We've had them since the Bronze Age and they have weathered some very turbulent times in their history. Um, last century wasn't the first time that, that politics has had a big impact on our hedges. Um, they've had land enclosures, riots and uprisings. Um, but I think because we're now recognising how many ways hedges benefit us, there's a growing interest in making sure they thrive and making sure that we have them for our future generations. At the end of the day, we've actually got a lot to thank farmers for when it comes to our hedges. Hedges are a man-made, man-managed habitat and it's actually centuries of farming that's led to this wonderful network of hedgerows um so uh, you know this poster shows the history of hedgerows i would say it's it's great to look back but it's time to start looking forward we know what we need to do to make sure hedgerows have a good future we know they need life cycle management they need a return to that sort of life cycle approach and i'm optimistic so collectively we are waking up to the benefits of healthy hedges um, we've got the promise of 45,000 miles of new hedge from, from the government um, between now and 2050. There are schemes, um, go, uh, farming schemes that, I, that encourage good management of hedges that will improve them as a home, as a food source and in their connectivity. Um, and now there's better and more accessible advice more than ever to help at every layer of this. Um, but I'd also go back to that point that we already have 400,000 kilometres of hedgerow nationally. And by tweaking the way we manage that, this existing hedgerow network, we have the potential to see some rapid change with little to no encroachment on the land area that feeds us. Largely, the infrastructure is already there. We just need to make the most of it. We need to turn it back into that ecological dynamite that we know it can be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, that was oh, it's a pleasure. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So filled with pictures and inspiring. Uh, yeah, amazing. I really love that um, diagram, the, the 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 graph that shows that we're actually planting more and more each year. And oh, it gives I, me so much hope. Yeah, yeah. So much <laughs> I, I I feel like we've turned the tide because I now have many more optimistic slides than I have pessimistic slides. <laughs> 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 That's a very good sign. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that, and I'm sure that everyone's learned an incredible amount and is probably minds are buzzing and thinking about hedgerows a lot now. And I, I certainly remember when I first um, heard your talk, and just yeah, never looked at a hedgerow diff, um, the same uh, since. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Does anyone have any questions? I'm happy to answer some questions. Yeah, so let me, I'll just look in the chat, but if anyone um, has any has any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself and um, um, ask your questions. Hi, yeah, this is Lisa Scott. We've got, uh, on my parish, we've got a um, very old hawthorn hedge. It's about four foot high, but it's really badly infiltrated with ivy. What's the best way for us to get rid of the ivy? And then should we be looking at, planting with some additional species and layering it in a couple of years time 
it sounds like you already know what you need to do <laughs> yes so ivy ivy is a controversial one um ivy is a fantastic species for wildlife it provides fantastic nesting habitat and really good late season um forage for pollinators but in hedgerows it can be problematic so to me i like to use ivy in a hedge as an indicator that your hedge has been in the same place in its life cycle for too long so if it's four foot my guess is it's been four foot for a very long time. Is that right? For about the last 70 years. Yeah, okay, yes, yes. So that's what hedges can't cope with in the long term. So the, the ivy, if I'm right, if it's a hawthorn hedge, it's going to be four foot high. Most of the growth is going to be at the top. The bottom's going to be looking a bit scraggy and you're going to have ivy up the stems. Is that roughly what it's that's sort exactly of looking like? exactly what it looks yeah, like, okay. yes. So, so hawthorn hedge is a classic for that. The ivy going up the stems will be stopping. Um, most plants have what we call epicormic buds. So they're little buds that could become branches um, if they got woken up out of dormancy. Um, ivy will, they're, and they're all down the trunk. Ivy will be preventing any of those turning into branches. Um, so it does smother any any other growth coming from it. So I use ivy, uh, ivy up the trunk and at the trim line. Um, uh, as an indicator so up the trunk is often an indicator that your hedge needs laying so your hedge will probably also be stem poor it's probably used to have way more stems than it does now it's probably getting a bit thin so i would suggest yours probably needs laying so if it's four foot high it needs to be higher so let it up for a few years you can trim the sides if it's next to a road or if it needs to be trimmed but just don't trim the top let it get to about 10 12 14 foot um, and then get someone in to lay it what that will do, they'll hike out the ivy when they lay it, which is good. Um, and what that will do is each stem that gets laid will grow back with lots of new stems. So you'll get a much, much thicker, denser hedge right from the ground up. Um, as you said, if it's just a hawthorn hedge and it's already probably got a bit thin on the ground, it might need some planting up whilst you do that. A great opportunity to put some more species in. Um, the, the the single species hawthorn hedges that we've got we got because it was quick and easy we didn't do that because it was particularly beneficial we did it because it was quick and easy um, but now we know how much better mixed species hedges are we can retrofit <laughs> so whenever we rejuvenate whenever we gap up put as many species in there as 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 you'd like have a look to see what's what grows well locally what suits the local area and diversify um, so absolutely let it up, Thank get you. it laid, put, put a few more species in whilst you do it. Thank you. So I'm just looking at the chat and Susan Doxett has asked, can every hedge plant species be laid? Um, some are easier than others, um, but pretty much all conventional hedge species can be laid. Um, some some things have a propensity to snap <laughs> um spindle is a good one for snapping um holly uh I, I know some people lay holly absolutely fine but it always snaps on me um um most species can be laid there are some that that conventionally are taken out when the hedge is being laid so things like elder that that again is another controversial species fantastic for wildlife really really good plant um but can do some damage to a hedge um it also doesn't lay very well and it you know it, it's quite brittle so it doesn't make a stock proof um hedge so mostly when when people lay hedges they remove quite a lot of the elder personally i would say if your hedge doesn't need to be stock proof then i would tolerate some elder because elder again is wonderful for for um for, for wildlife um i'm also partial to a bit of elderberry wine so <laughs> it's nice to have some in the countryside um uh, but most most species can be laid. Um, Broadleaf species, I should say. Uh, uh, yeah, there's yeah. Anything you'd find in a traditional countryside hedge is is there because that hedge has been laid several generations through. And and because sometimes you come across a yew hedge, don't you? Like old yew hedges, and they're they they can be like incredibly slow is that right oh yeah so that that's probably one of the examples actually that, that thank you for, for reminding me of you hedges um uh, of because that they they are that you tend to find them um uh around churches and around larger states so that they're, they're not they're not what i would classify as a sort of countryside 
hedge as such, even if you find them in the countryside. But yes, broadleaf species, I would say, hedgy broadleaf species can all, can all lay. And we've got another question in the chat from Sarah Sawyer saying, um, at what stage of growth does a hedge store most of its carbon or is it relatively stable? It's an interesting question. Ah, so this is a difficult one. We don't know, we don't know everything that needs to be known about hedge carbon yet. Um, but there's some really interesting research from um, uh, uh, Dr. Sophia Biffy and Dr. Uh, Pippa Chapman up in the University of Leeds. Um, and they've looked at where the hedge stores and at what time in its life cycle and it's up to 12 years old so 12 years old seems to be the peak sort of rate of carbon storage but the thing with carbon storage and hedges is that you will be planting a hedge it will be storing all this carbon and then at some point you need to rejuvenate it so you need to lay it or crop it and of course at that point a lot of that carbon gets taken away now, traditionally, that would be piled up and burned. We're looking in new avenues of what to do with that brush now. So chipping it and using it as a mulch, turning it into biochar, which which makes it a sort of stable form of carbon that can also be used to sort of um, benefit soils and improve and, and improve soils. Um, or using that brush in other ways. So creating dead hedges, creating short term connectivity. Um, um, but the, but the point the point remains that. Um, you can only count that carbon once. So the, the carbon will grow in a hedge, but you need to accommodate the idea that that hedge will need to be coppiced or laid um, every sort of 40 or so years. So it's um, there's, there's an awful lot of complexity when it comes to carbon accounting and hedgerows. Yeah. Um, oh, so there's another question in the chat um, asking um, about flailing. So saying, is the message getting across to those contractors behind the flailing? <laughs> well, Yes and no. Um, so we, we're we doing an awful lot of work with the farming community. I go around, I spend my winters going from, from farm cluster group to cluster group, talking to farmers about how they manage their hedges. Um, and certainly there's an awful lot of appetite for managing their hedges differently and better. Um, the a lot of what we see as the general public is ones along roadsides where there's much less flexibility with how they're managed obviously for safety reasons they obviously do need to be be trimmed back each year um but it the uh hedge cutting contractors are quite a difficult quite a difficult audience to reach so we are we are doing work um trying to make sure that the that the, the messages are getting through um but Unfortunately, again, from someone that that will be on the road a lot of the time seeing hedges, you know, that you might not necessarily see a lot of that change immediately. Hopefully, with the new SFIs as well, um, the incremental trimming, that trimming higher, higher, wider, 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 um, that for the first time ever, the government is now paying for that as a as a as a way of managing our hedgerows. So I'm I'm finding huge amount of optimism in that, um, and I believe I hope that enough if enough people take up this option within a year or two years, you will start seeing blossom filled hedgerows across the countryside. So fingers crossed, we will start seeing huge and rapid change. That sounds lovely. <laughs> that sounds lovely. We've actually got a hand up. Oh, hi. Um, Adam, did you want to talk? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm from a rights away background. So what you were just saying then about um, everything just being heavily flailed and cut back and all, all the stuff like that. Um, so basically, our main job is to, you know, give people access to the countryside, mm -hmm. which generally means just absolutely obliterating hedgerows and all the rest of it to get access and allow people, you know, along our paths, byways, and etc. Um, there's a few little sites that we own, uh, so we've recently tried to sort of scallop some hedgerows and stuff like that, try and you know allow for different species and stuff, which obviously is good. Um, but for the most part, it's for landowners. So is there any way that we can try and put, you know, promote them to do something better with their hedge? Bear in mind, they own the land, they own the hedge. They're probably not fussed on it. Is there anything we can do to sort of promote it? better than perhaps we already do? Um, I would say incremental trimming is a really good place to start because e e even in areas where um, where land is tight, it can just be 10 centimetres and that does make all the difference. You'll have 10 centimetres, a band around your hedge of young flowering wood that will flower and fruit. Um, and it also, if hedges, because obviously hedge trimming season starts in September the 1st, 
most of our hedges are still green and covered in leaves at that point. Um, and then when we trim them right back down to the wicks, they end up being like these little obliterated sticks. And they, to me, they, they look like a sore thumb in the countryside, which is otherwise green. Um, if we do incremental trimming, not only do we uh, allow some flowering and fruiting wood to stay on, but actually even when you trim that, we call it trimming it green. So it's still got leafy growth. And that's a sign that you haven't trimmed it right down to the wick. What that will do, in, the, in even in the first year of doing it, will mean blossom, will mean fruit and will mean better leafy growth. But it will also start to look more dense because you're starting to build up that sort of density of branching growth. So any landowner that is interested in having hedges look tidy um, and having them sort of controlled, I guess, like kept kept to a certain size i say this is a really good really good first step i, I call it the um the gateway the gateway drug to good hedge management because it's easy to do <laughs> it's really easy to do it gives you immediate effect um and it shows you what's possible it shows you that a slight tweak can make all the difference um and it's a really good one to try and get people on board with a slight difference just tweaking what they're doing already so once they start doing that they see how good it can be then they might be easier to sort of push the door a bit further to maybe thinking about rejuvenating hedges or or other things like that but to me that's 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 always a good first start when when you've got someone that might might otherwise be a bit reluctant to go whole hog <laughs> brilliant thank you for that um, is there any way that we can promote you guys? Is there anything that you've got that you could give us potentially to then pass on to landowners? And yes, to try absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, um, send me an email afterwards. Um, I've yep. got a series of, I've got a, a booklet that we call Healthy Hedgerows on Your Land, which we send out to the farming community quite a lot. Um, and it's got the life cycle, the benefits. It's got a whole load of messaging in there. Um, I uh, go around and do talks to any audience that I feel might make a difference. So contractors, landowners, farmers, um, councils for the council managed hedgerows, anyone that, that has an impact on hedgerows, I'm happy to go and talk to. So if you think there's an audience that, that would like to hear me whistle on about hedges, <laughs> I will happily come and chat. Um, or I can send you um, plenty of leaflets and things that have some of those infographics in and try sort of like a, a user-friendly um, approach to, to changing hedge management. Brilliant. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Send me an email. We, we can be in touch. Lovely. Um, so another thing in the chat, um, talking about the, the hedge consultation, mm -hmm. um, the recent hedge consultation. So um, is there any hope um, that hedge cutting season could be reduced? Um, um, talking I, about, as you mentioned, keeping the fruits and yeah. habitats for our wildlife over winter instead of cutting on 1st of September. I got the distinct impression from the wording of that document um, that the hedge cutting season is going to stay the same. Um, uh, and this is a, it's a bit of a double edged sword, really. Um, the consultation for those that don't that, that didn't know about it is a consultation to replace cross compliance. Um, which is a, a set of rules that farmers have to abide by. And this was part of EU law. Um, and this included when you trimmed hedges and how far, how close to a hedgerow you could cultivate. So cultivating, um, uh, spraying, herbiciding, pesticiding, plowing close to a hedge and when you can cut the hedge. Uh, I don't think, I personally don't think much is going to change from that consultation. Um, and potentially, I, d I don't know, there's, there's a lot to unpack with that consultation. Um, first of all, um, the cross compliance we're losing at the end of this year. So we've got a few more weeks of cross compliance left and then we are the Wild West. We don't have any rules. So the fastest way to get those rules back in place is for them not to change and we just put them into our domestic law. So part of me hopes they just go, right, we're just going to do what we used to do and then just put it into domestic law um because if they make too many changes to it it's going to take years before that's actually in place and we will have years where our hedges are not protected in that in those same ways um i would love to see a shorter period of hedge trimming especially because things like dormice so you know hedge trimming starts on the first of september dormice will still have active breeding nests into october 
And now the, the heartbreaking thing about this is that little dormice put their breeding nests with their little baby dormice right below the trim line of a hedge. So you've got where the hedge gets trimmed and then you've got this little ball of, of, of baby dormice just below it. Um, so from my point of view, I would love it to, to, to go for further it back you know it would be wonderful if it was maybe late October to January February or maybe even November but this does come with a massive compromise so from my point of view and wildlife's point of view trimming it in January February is amazing but if you are in an area that's got heavy clay or an area that gets sodden you know half of the country is, was underwater in October um there's no there's no way that they can delay that hedge trimming in some areas um without threatening to do massive compaction damage to the margins getting their machinery on wet soil so um the SFIs have a decent compromise with this you either trim your hedge on a two-year rotation and trim it in January February um to accommodate for, for berries to be there all winter or you trim on a three-year rotation and you can trim it from September till January. So I think that's a compromise um, basically to accommodate the fact that soils can't take compaction when they're heavy uh, and, and full of water. So yeah, it's it's a balance basically. Um, but from, from, from my, and this is just my opinion, from the wording of that document, I don't believe we're going to get too many changes to, to that legislation. I think mostly it's going to be just carried through. But that's, yeah, that's just me predicting, really. <laughs> Who knows when we'll, when we'll get the, 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 the final results of that consultation. Yeah, interesting. Do we know when it might, when it might? Um, no, we don't. No, we don't, no. Well, I think we've already been warned that we're probably going to have at least a year um, without any regulation. Um, so there's going to be a, a, at least one year gap where those regulations are no longer filled. Mm. Just fingers crossed it's not longer. <laughs> Very. And we've got um, someone saying, uh, Susan saying that um, perhaps hedge cutting season needs to change with climate change, for example, with birds. Um, Richard, Richard. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult because... Um, end of February you can trim all the way to the end of February at the moment um, and there are signs especially in in some areas in the south that birds are starting to nest earlier um, I don't know enough about it personally my hunch is there won't be any eggs laid um, in in current nesting season it might just be the beginnings of a nest being built now that still does impact on the birds because if that beginning of that nest is then obliterated by a hedge trimmer they have to start the process again and start building another nest um, and that might mean that might be the difference between them having one clutch of chicks and, and not two um who knows um but i don't know the, the, we we do need to also accommodate for the fact that hedge trimming is quite a mammoth task um and if we squeeze it at both ends it's going to be very difficult actually to get all of that done i would love to see hedges trimmed less frequently anyway so only trimming a third of the hedges each year um but you know we've got to be realistic that that's not going to happen all all over at once um so I don't know um, is the answer to that one. I don't I don't know enough about the the, the bird nesting um, yeah. and, and how they're changing across the countryside. Mm. Yeah, it's just getting more complicated. It is, uh, yeah, <laughs> very much so. Yeah. And in that same message, actually, um, Susan's also mentioned about um, the import, like just mentioning the ditch importance um, of of uh, in hedgerows. No, thoroughly. Is... Did I not mention ditches? I, I normally talk about ditches know. all the time. Ditches, Sorry. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> ditches are fantastic. Anywhere the way you get soil meeting water, meeting the open air, is really very important. So not only do you get um, uh, a much more interesting array of plant species, but that's where your insect biomass comes from. Now, it, it, back in the day, we drained an awful lot of our land so that we can, uh, so we can actually crop from it. We started out doing drains next to hedges and those are the, those were our ditches full of full of insects full of plants full of wildlife amazing amazing what we then did was we put drains under the ground so we put field drains in and that basically meant that the water seeped through the soil into the field drains and they get drained straight away so there's not none of that sort of water soil and open air interaction um and i think there's an well 
this uh, being a huge drop in insects uh, biomass and 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 diversity and i think that is contributing to it we th those areas where those those elements interact are really very important um so hedge ditches are a win um basically adding water where you can add water it always helps wildlife if anyone says how can i make this more biodiversity friendly i'm like add a pond put some water in there <laughs> um because there are always places where where those those interactions are needed mm. Yeah. yeah, and you don't see ditches at all with hedges a lot of the time. I mean, are they are they more? Um, is would ditches have been with hedges all across the country, or are ditches more associated with West Country hedges? No, they would have been all over. Yeah. But they they did have more cultural prominence in some areas. So, um, especially wet areas will have had much more ditching. Um, but they, they they would have been much more common than they are now. We 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 rely on field drainage more than more than di hedge ditches mm. nowadays. They, I mean, field drainage is much more efficient. Let's be honest. Um, but it just doesn't have all those wonderful botanical and insect benefits that a that a ditch will. Yeah, yeah. Oh. A pain to maintain though. <laughs> it's just another level of maintenance is a is a hedge ditch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you don't don't see them. I don't see them at all in Hampshire. With um big ditches, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of all the, the hedges I've seen recently. I can't think of many with ditches. Mm. Well, looking at the chat, looks like that's all the questions. Does anyone have any any questions? Who's who's still listening in? Um, feel free to feel free to turn off your mute. Um, oh, just could so so many so many things are, are fascinating about hedges. There's a so much to learn. <laughs> I've got a whole page of notes, and I've actually had <laughs> more. <laughs> yeah. So thank, thank you so much. Or maybe this no, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to me talk about hedges for over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> it's a lovely way to spend the evening. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah. So thank you, thank you, everyone, so much. Oh, I've got another hand up, or is that a wave? A clap. Oh, it's a clap. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah thank you um yeah thank you so much everyone for for coming and thank you so much um, megan for that talk um totally totally interesting um and we have recorded it so if i've done it right hopefully i can um upload it onto our youtube channel um people to see I'll, I'll cut off cut off the the um beginnings where we've got photos of people in them um but yeah um thank you so much everyone for for listening and i hope you feel inspired and when you're uh, driving in your car uh, tomorrow you will not look at hedges the same way as you did before um and please if you want to learn more about hedgerows if you want to um uh, get involved in in restoring hedgerows um in in hampshire so i put links in the chat for some pts pages um um because there's so much information um to learn on on um, the website a pts website um but i've also put in the link to sign up to our newsletter um which we've got lots of things for people to get involved with whether that be talks more talks or um planting or training um or events like community events that we'll be putting on um so yeah please check that out um but also if you're keen to to get some plants back uh some hedgerows back into the countryside then um I'll be taking out volunteers every thursday throughout the whole of winter so all the way to the end of march planting hedgerows We've got five kilometers of hedgerow to plant as part of this project this winter. So um, I would love I would love for people to join us. We actually were out all day today. Um, it was really cold, but it was lovely. Um, and I think we must have planted a bit over 100 meters, which was really, really good. But um, it would be lovely to have more people out with us. Um, and uh, if, if you do work um, in the weekdays and Thursdays is a really annoying day. We're also doing some weekend days um in january february and march so um email me um look at the links that i've put on um sign up as a volunteer but it'd be lovely to to see see more of you again but yeah thank you so much everyone and yeah thanks again megan yeah Brilliant. a pleasure thank you very much lovely Bye. all right bye-bye thank you cheers thank you